Yes. Okay, fantastic. Well, thank you so much for, like, wow, I didn't expect this room to fill up with uh, so many people because, I mean, this room is amazing, right? I think I, I can't remember having spoken in an amazing location like this. So, yeah, sorry, I <laughs> last minute changed the title of my talk. It's now called Neurography, Two Years in Latent Space. And we will find out what that means very soon. Yes. Um, this is an image that has been entirely generated by an artificial intelligence. Um, I wouldn't say it's art, but to me it definitely looks kind of artsy and uh, definitely interesting. Uh, some people say, oh, it reminds me of uh, Francis Bacon. I don't know. I mean, I'm getting all these, it reminds me of. I hope at some point people say, oh, it reminds me of Mario Klingemann. But okay, I guess I have to to work on this for a bit. But yes, uh, this talk will be uh, about kind of how I create these things and uh, what neurography is and latent spaces. But we have to start a bit at the beginning and that is deep learning because that is kind of what it all starts with. Um, you might not know it, but deep learning was principally made to turn cats into data. Uh, not quite exactly, it's more like images of cats into data. Um, if you look at an image of a cat, actually it is already data. Every pixel is already like an RGB value and it has a coordinate, but the problem is it's way too much information. So what neural networks do when they try to figure out if there's a cat on it is to kind of let the air out of an image and reduce it to kind of the meaningful stuff. Um, to do that, we use convolutional neural networks, which are these kind of linked layer layers that contain neurons, and each layer kind of breaks down the image further and further from kind of up like superficial features, like looking at pixels first, down to something that, uh, well, where it thinks it sees an eye or a wheel or something like that. So if you look in inside a neural network, what happens when you send in an image, it actually looks a lot like Photoshop, like some bad Photoshop filters. Because like on the left, uh, you see kind of the, the first stuff where the cat s is still visible, but the further down it goes, it just kind of like, it looks really like first for edges, then it combines edges into, um, into like combinations of edges, maybe some edges become a circle, and then a circle, multiple circles, maybe later on it rec recognizes as a face, and then maybe it differentiates uh, animal faces from human faces. So that's kind of how these things work. Inside, the layers have certain functions. So initially, it deals more with textures and uh, things that are, well, we consider style, and lower down, it's actually getting to contents where it gets concepts like eyes, roof, uh, window, something like that. But at the very end, and that is where it's getting interesting for me, it turns every image into a so-called feature vector. And if you, well, had geometry in school, you know kind of what a vector is. And we usually deal with two-dimensional or three-dimensional vectors that tell us where a point is in space. Actually, this is pretty much the same. A feature vector is just has more than three dimensions. Those feature vectors have 128 or even like thousands of dimensions, which we are not really used to thinking in or we can't really imagine them. But in the end, it doesn't really matter how many dimensions it is. Uh, every feature vector is kind of a coordinate of an image in this multidimensional space. And the magic that it happens is that similar images, like let's say you have two cats, will end up in this multidimensional space in, uh, in, the in a neighborhood, whereas uh, cars might end up somewhere here. Obviously, in this, I only have, I only can point you in three dimensions. Because we cannot really imagine how this actually looks like, there are some interesting techniques for dimensionality reduction, which kind of project this multidimensional space down to something like two dimensions where we can actually see it. Uh, one technique is called Tisni, and uh, well, you should remember it because you you get actually you probably have seen it a lot. And really, what it does, it takes all these images, like all these feature vectors that make up this so-called latent space, and projects them back to 2D. And then you start getting these landscapes. And what happens is that actually 
you find the cats somewhere. Oh, actually, that might be Duisburg there. I don't know. But uh, <laughs> like if this was a map of Europe. Uh, problem is, because it's a projection from a multidimensional space, some cats are also somewhere else. It's not that simple. They maybe there are the photos of cats, and there are the drawings of cats, and those are people dressed in cat costumes. But the it actually works so well that I we can use it for interesting purposes. One way I try to imagine kind of like these multidimensional spaces of data or meaningful data is like laundry, where once you have done your laundry, pull out your stuff, well, things wrap uh, around each other. I don't know, you have the jeans wrapped around the pullover and the sock in the pocket of, uh, of it. Well, what the machine tries to do is to kind of untangle the data and figure out, oh yeah, all this is actually the genes, and this is uh, the pullover, or this is the cats, and this is the dog. So the machine untwists this weird space. Okay, what are things that we can do with it? So obviously one thing is to detect similarity. If you have lots of images, to find similar ones. So one thing I did, I helped the British Library that had kind of automatically scanned one million books, uh, no, one million images out of books, out of copyright. And so they had this huge data set, one million engravings, illustrations, but the problem is that you would have to look at one image to figure out what's on it because they were, they were automatically cut out of books. So I tried to help them in actually finding, like, la labeling them and tagging them. And once using these machine learning, deep learning techniques, once you have that, well, you can actually search for stuff. And then I find these things like rock tools, which I don't know, probably nobody gets really excited about rock tools or uh, stone tools. But well, the interesting thing is once you start collecting things like this, you decide, oh, this is the third rock tool I saw passing by. Well, maybe I should start a collection. Then you start getting excited about it. And uh, well, in this way, I kind of try to bring them back to the to the light and uh, so people can appreciate actually the the hard work that went into illustrating them or just well enjoy the the interesting like the, the details or geological profiles uh, so these are 32 or so anonymous profiles or 16 very sad girls so you make all these interesting discoveries in these uh, randomly scanned books and well you learn about culture or certain things that, well, you uh, start asking questions, oh, why, why are there so many sad girls, uh, sad women? So, well, actually, this, this was kind of like Pulp Fiction back then, before TV and stuff, so they had all these uh, thrilling stories for the masses. Well, there's also a series of uh, Desperate Men, so I didn't put it in, but yes, they are also kind of <sighs> in trouble. Well, what you can do, you can you ha you're not limited to doing this with s still pictures. You can also do the same searches with entire movies. So here's an example where I just took an example of kind of old black and white movies and tried to find certain scenes. In this case, just close up of hands. So the, mis the the AI in this case went through the entire movies, cut it up automatically into scenes. So it it detected when there is a different scene by just seeing oh something big has changed. And then I gave it examples, say, okay, here's one scene with a hand, find me more that look like this. <laughs> and that looks like this. Becoming Wiley. Completed the first step in the process. Big Mickey hit on him. Must be. Boys are concerned this has never been out of the locker, okay? Right. Yeah. So obviously you could do that with anything that you are interested in. So, well, instead of having to look at hundreds of hours of, of, of movies yourself. And there is, I mean, famous example is an artist called Christian McClay who did this wonderful 24-hour installation called The Clock where he just found scenes where there's a, a clock showing up in a, 
in a movie somewhere, and while you watch the movie, which is a 24-hour movie, whenever a clock comes into view, it actually shows the current time. I love that piece. Uh, another work that deals with similarity and dealing with huge collections of data or images, in this case cultural artifacts, is called X Degrees of Separation and was a commission I did for Google. And I guess you are familiar with, uh, the, with the principle of six degrees of separation, that in some way every person on the planet is linked to any other person on the planet by just kind of six acquaintances. So I know somebody who knows somebody, and maybe like two more steps, and then you are somehow linked to a person a noodle cook in Shanghai or somebody. So, so I thought, does the same thing work with uh, artworks? And can we find links between any two artworks, cultural artifacts? And uh, I did that using the same algorithm that drives Google Image Search. You know the one where you drag an image uh, onto the search and then it will find you similar images. And in this case, it builds up this kind of roadmap of things that are connected visually that look similar. And then you can ask, how do I get from Starry Night to a Greek statue? And it'll find intermediate images that eventually get you there. And so the installation looks like this. And the results are, for example, on the left you see this portrait of a girl, on the right you see a statue, and you can definitely see that the machine finds all these kind of shape similarities, color similarities, stands. Well, you see, it still stays within the um, kind of, it's all figures and persons. The whole data set is 500,000 images, so it could have picked anything else, but it makes something like a logical progression. Or if you stay within just like objects like uh, vases or bottles, you can see they you have a blue is predominant, but the shape changes. And yeah, it's the way the machine sees the world, which is not necessarily exactly the same how we would like put things. Well, for me, this allows to like, especially if the if you have more and more data that where you could potentially find something. The question is always, where do you start finding? Right? You, everybody knows maybe a hundred, two hundred artists. So maybe your favorite artworks. You could start there, but. If you don't know what the right question are to ask, then, well, you might never find it. So this opens up a door for serendipity, where maybe you start and end with something you know, but on the road between, you might find things that you also find interesting or actually like. And another one. So, well, obviously, uh, if you want to train or if you want to have artificial neural networks do something like a task for you, you have to train them. And when you deal with images, well, the training process is really you have to give it lots of examples first. You have to say, like, cats, this is a cat, this is a cat, no, this is a dog, and this is a house. So you have to actually give it thousands of images and label them. There are pre-trained models, fortunately, um, especially for mundane tasks like detecting cats, and you can use them like that to help you, but if you want something more exotic, you have to go through the task in uh, and actually telling the model what to do. So because that process, like especially is if you're a single person like me, sounds a bit kind of like overwhelming, like 20,000 images labeling them, I built myself some tools. So example was, uh, again, the British Library collection. And I guess you're all familiar with optical character recognition, where, well, a machine can recognize a text. But usually, that works with well-defined letters. So in this collection, there are all these beautiful uh, illustrative uh, initials. But they come in all shapes, decorations, and stuff. So I wondered, can I train a program that, that can detect those with some good problem, like with some good hit rate. And in order to do this, I had to do all these, like manually tag them. What you can do is you can start very quickly by just giving it like, let's say 10 examples of each letter and start training a model. And training it is really like you do 26 folders where you throw in the letters and then you start hitting the model with it. Problem is that will not give you very good results, but 
you can then use the model to, to, to show you an image and say, oh, okay, I think this is an A or a B, and then you can say yes or no. And a classic principle uh, that you might have been using is Tinder, where you can very quickly go swipe left, swipe right, and exactly that's kind of what I built me. So the model tells me, I think this is an A, I say yes or no. And this way, I can go through thousands of images in one hour and am through with the task of my training data very quickly. And the result was it actually worked really well. So it detected me all those different letter shapes. Uh, it actually got to a point well, where it showed me something like this because the problem is the model only knows letters. It doesn't know anything else about the world. So in a way, it sees letters in everything. So it showed me this image and said, I think this is a B. And I said, oh, I'm not so sure. I think this is a ruin. But the nice thing is I can go back to the original page where that came from, that image, and had a look. And it turned out, oh, actually, it is a B. It's actually another initial. So then, well, as I said before, like if everything you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail, it gives me all these beautiful failures, like uh, where it says, oh, it's an F, it, A, L, I, and L. So I started actually actively collecting the most interesting failures. So here's a series of... Uh, A's, where it detected A's, or M's, shapes that look M-ish, or T's. So in a way, again, the machine becomes kind of an inspirational tool where I could take this further, make a font out of it, or something like that. But yes, um, this model is all kind of detection. So now, well, let's get to the part where I can actually start generating things with a neural network. And I call this process neurography. And the reason is, I told you before about this latent space, which is kind of the internal representation of like how the model has learned to see the world. And well, you cannot only go into this space, but you can also project out of this space, so you can generate images back. So I see myself like a photographer that kind of goes to a coordinate in this latent space and ask the machine, show me what's here. And then it gives me back a picture. And then I decide if this is interesting or I might move on, find a more, diff uh, more interesting place. So it's kind of not making images by code, but it's really training a model and then trying to make it interest, like generate interesting things. So two years ago, actually it's very young, this whole technique. Uh, you might have heard about Deep Dream. I mean, we have seen it. That was kind of the first way to visualize what neural networks see. And the effect was very psychedelic, and pretty much everybody got very quickly annoyed by it. I mean, initially it was like, whoa, this is something we have never seen. But then, well, it got so popular that quickly like uh, everybody started hating it. Because there was one problem, it created all these puppies, and uh, and snakes and snails, so it was already quite weird. The reason was because, well, the trained pre-trained model that came with it had kind of was specialized on, uh, well, it it knew how to distinguish 120 or so different dog breeds. So it had a very keen eye for dogs, but not for the rest. So. The reason what I tried to do was, okay, maybe I can get rid of the dogs uh, by just training my own model. So what you here see is a model trained on record albums. And here you have the, the heavy metal category where everything gets turned into skulls. But yeah, so in a way, Deep Dream, I mean, the way it works, you feed in an image, the it goes through the neural network and then the neural network feeds the image back up, emphasizing everything it thinks it has seen in the image. So if it thinks it has seen an eye, that part of the image becomes more eye-like. And if it thinks it has seen a puppy, then this will become more puppyish. So it's not fully generation, but this is definitely what got me hooked into this whole field of generating with these models. So one thing I tried was in order, like changing the model a bit and turning off neurons and so have it only kind of emphasize single items. So maybe like you could say that uh, like m visual molecules of the image so that just emphasize a certain texturousness of the image. So yes, I said it. So these are kind of 
atoms out of like texture atoms out of which whole images are made up. So these create these, I don't know, looks like uh, electron micro microsco <laughs> microscopy uh, something. I found those quite interesting, but more like used as textures. Um, but fortunately for me, technology progresses. And I'm not a scientist, so I'm totally dependent on the research that other scientists do. And fortunately, there's also now this open source culture where the scientists uh, not only share the paper, but they also put source code on GitHub or other places. And then I can go take it, try it out, change it. So one of those papers was called Synthesizing the Preferred Inputs for Neurons in Neural Networks via, via Deep Generator Networks. And what it does is, instead of doing this deep dream effect where you emphasize what's in the image, it, takes, it starts with noise and then kind of changes every pixel in a way that it tries to look more like a certain category. So if you start with noise and you want the cat category, it will slowly start changing the pixels so they get more and more cat-like. Uh, what is inter interesting too, you can do that within a fully untrained network, which is not empty, but is filled with random numbers. And what you get then is kind of a flight through a latent space, kind of, and that's what you're going to see here now. So this is kind of going into, a, a into this latent space and trying to visualize how it looks in a, well, in a random network. And you can see it's not fully random. You see these abstract shapes that emerge, some of them, I don't know, tennis ball, chicken, I don't know. But it's rather abstract. But I find that interesting because, uh, yes, I can start working from that. What you can also see is it's very low resolution. That is still kind of an issue working with these, uh, with these models because the GPUs have only a certain amount of capacity. So the, the the gaming cards, that's where we run all our stuff on. So uh, we have to like have to be very thankful to the whole gaming industry that those GPUs became so affordable because that those are doing the whole work now. Um, but yes, then I can go and take interesting ones where I think the shape or the color composition is nice and then, well, I, I curate them in the end. So I have it produce a thousand images and then using the Tinder approach, I can say, yes, that's interesting, that's not. But in the end, my way to control the output is really kind of training a model and picking the, the output. And uh, I quickly show you kind of how to combine that with music. Don't worry, it's, uh, I will not show the entire video. Um, so this is taking music, analyzing that, and projecting it into kind of that latent space and then linking it up with, uh, with those abstract images. So what happens is that when the music sounds similar, it will go to the same space back in that latent space, in that visual latent space. So you will see kind of how it repeats certain images when the music sounds similar. So let's hear some zombie nation. Don't get shocked. I hope the sound is on. But I stop here because, yes, maybe not uh, all of you are techno fans because it's getting better. Because the, the next thing that came up, which was less than a year ago, are so-called generative adversarial networks. And it's kind of a short GAN. And they are very interesting because they are very intuitively to train for an artist if you are into visuals. The way it works is you battle two neural networks against e is, uh, each other. One is kind of the generator or forger that tries to generate an image for a certain task, and the other one is the discriminator or judge, and it tries to judge if what the generator has made is a fake or a real image based on the training data. And then whenever one makes a mistake, it learns from that mistake, and over time they're getting better and better. 
you might have seen this example of uh, ed like edges to cats, where on the left side you draw this little scribble, black and white, and on the right uh, the output you get is uh, something that looks like a cat, because that model was trained on cats. So for me, the int I didn't do that. So the interesting part is, so you give it some image form, like a simple sketch, and the desired result, like a photo, and the model will try to figure something out, how to turn this into that. And the first approach I tried was uh, to do something like this TV enhance filter, where in the movies, you know, you, you have this whatever scene where somebody's really blurred and badly to be seen, and then they say, oh, can you enhance that? So I tried, can I unblur an image? So training-wise, I give it pairs of a very blurred image and a real image, and then after giving it thousands of examples, it will try to learn how to reconstruct that blurred image. And the results look like this. So on the left, you see my input, which is this blurry thing. And on the right, you get something, well, that definitely doesn't look like a photo, but it definitely adds new structure and fantasizes, especially the face. Well, and so I really like the, like the look of it because it has painterly and, uh, well, it adds new content. It makes up new information in that image. Or, well, it works better with, like, if the structures are not that small. So, well, instead of calling it enhancement, I call it transhancement, meaning, so, yes, because it transforms the image. And it's very useful because it allows me to go big in a bigger scale. And so with photos, you get these kind of spooky looking zombies, but yes, so what I did, I gave it a photo, blurred it, and then the model makes up these interesting details. Uh, let's go to this one. So for example, this is a photo, and then you look at it, and well, you can go deeper and deeper, and it will always make up new information. And for me, that is the interesting part, when the model actually starts to getting kind of creative. Well, it's probably not creative, it's more statistics, but it's definitely forms that I find, uh, well, surprising and interesting. So another face. And yes, yeah, so th this is Mr. Cat face. So what I like about it, really, the model ge generates output that I do not necessarily expect. So I'm getting these surprises. Um, so problem was with this approach that I took photos I found on the internet. And so I wanted to have my own content to start with. So the first thing I tried was like, can I, well, create images that look like they contain people? So the first thing I have to do is to find like, how do people look? And fortunately there are neural networks that allow me to kind of take a photo that contains persons and it will extract me stick figures from it saying like, oh, this is the pose. And when I randomly interpolate through them, then it looks like it's a movie, but it's actually not. So it's just kind of like the, the machine has kind of learned how humans usually pose themselves. And I will skip this because time is short, but I can actually, like, again, link this to music and make figures dance. But uh, what I did is then I trained again, pix to pix, this model. And on the left top, you see the input. It's just a stick figure. On the right, you see what the neural network generates afterwards, uh, having been trained on tons of photos, I think uh, 50,000 photos. So it gets something like an idea, like how people look. Uh, it's again, very abstract, very painterly. So depending on how you train it, you could get better, but I wasn't actually not interested. I'm, I want kind of these, this look. So again, input on the left, and this is what the model outputs. Again, this photo is not on the training set. It's really making it up out of everything it has seen before. Another one. And so, obviously, there's what happens is there's lots of things that uh, just don't look like anything or that don't appeal to me. So I'm becoming more like a curator of what the machine outputs. And obviously, I have, if everything the machine doesn't look good, that the machine produced doesn't look good, well, I have to retrain the model. And, well, this looks like Dali to me, I don't know. So, again, reminds me of. But I find these quite uh, quite interesting. And like, so you start, like, obviously, if you see persons on it, uh, you 
can ask, like, you can tell yourself stories, what might, going, might be going on there, at least I can. So this looks like, to me, like a uh, Formula One driver, so I don't know, but maybe other people see other things. And, uh, oh, uh oh, I have to skip this. <laughs> Sorry, because, yes, uh, I do three minutes over time. Um, because the next thing I want was, like, I can do poses, I also want to do faces. So again, same principle. I have a biometric face ma marker and, uh, and face data, and then over time the machine can learn that. And what I can do is then I generate random faces on the left with these markers, and I get out what the machine has learned. I can do actually photorealistic almost, but I'm kind of more interested in the weird stuff. So this is a feedback loop where I chain two models together, one generates faces, one recognizes them, and then the, the cycle starts. And because it only has been trained on faces, it will generate this soup because it starts seeing an eye somewhere and then boop, the eye becomes like grows eyebrows and the second pair. Then I can train it on doll faces that transforms faces to doll faces. And yes, it's all kind of creepy and spooky. <coughs> and no. Actually, I, I'm over time, so I have to skip that too, but uh, let's have a look at this because uh, what I can also do is I can, uh, well, since I have the face markers and I can train a model just on a single person, in this case, uh, the French singer Francois Hardy, um, it learns to generate just her. But then I can take the face markers of somebody else and it will try to mimic like what the left person says and uh, Play it back to answer the question on her. of why so the president asked the White House press secretary to come out in front of the podium for the first time and utter a falsehood. Why did he do that? It undermines the credibility of the entire White House press office no, it on doesn't. day don't one. Be so, don't be so overly dramatic about it, Chuck. What it, it, you're saying it's a falsehood, and they're giving Sean Spicer, our press secretary, gave alternative facts to that. But the okay. So, damn, uh, okay, well, you can see the quality was kind of low, like a, a low-risk video, but that was on purpose. Now it, there are techniques where you can actually get photorealistic. Um, so this is kind of more this warning sign that you should not believe anymore what you see. Like, you should actually, like, if you see something that looks real, see where it came from, where it came from, who tries to tell your story, because yes, the neural networks have arrived at a stage where they can pretty convincingly fake data, fake, fake images. Here are a few more examples of models I trained on, let's say, photographic decay, where I, I found photos that were beautifully destroyed, and uh, I tried to kind of, I trained the model on actually regenerating the effect, and because I, I, I totally love decay. And the final thing is, again, I was talking about the resolution thing where the, the, thing, the, the models create really small images. If you want to scale them up, you have to introduce new information. So one idea was, well, I just take existing things like uh, nice textures and have a model kind of figure out where to fit it best. And this is then taking, again, British library material, faces I have generated, and it tries to reconstruct the face from just given collage material. And those look like these things. So depending on what I feed it in, it's trying to regenerate the material from the given data. And there's something with poses. And another one, one more, and thank you. <laughs>